Hello friends, welcome to jwreasoning.com. Before I begin, I just want to thank you all for the prayers, for the emails, for the comments about praying for the lady. And uh, she's doing okay, she's stable, and she just needs more care. So thank you for those prayers and please continue to pray for her. I really appreciate it and I know that she does too. I've told her that many people are praying for her and we really appreciate it very much. This Watchtower lesson is entitled, Continue to Benefit from Godly Fear. And we're going to begin by just taking a look at paragraph one. Paragraph one, they use this phrase, brazen conduct. Now I looked this phrase up. I looked it up in a bunch of different Bibles and every Bible translation that I have, and I couldn't find the phrase brazen conduct. I even looked it up on the Watchtower Library and I noticed that it's not used in the 1984 edition of the New World Translation, except for in a footnote about Tartarus. So where does this phrase, brazen conduct, where did it begin? Well, I've noticed that in the elders book, they talk about brazen conduct in the Shepherding the Flock of God book. Anyone can find a copy of the Shepherding the Flock book online if you want to look up this phrase, brazen conduct. And they always use it in a disfellowshipping sense. They use it when they're going to be disfellowshipping someone from the organization. Now, brazen conduct, when I looked up the verse that it's referring to in 2 Peter, it actually, in the New King James, uses the word either lewdness or filthy conduct, where the New World Translation uses brazen conduct. So this word brazen is kind of an old word. It's, uh, when I looked it up online, it said it was archaic. So they even give an archaic definition for it. So it's kind of interesting to look at those things and see. But these are things that I notice about the organization. They have their own vernacular, and I do plan to do a video on that very soon. But let's move along here. Paragraph three starts off, a key reason to protect our figurative heart is that Jehovah examines our heart. This means that he looks past what we appear to be to others and sees who we really are on the inside. But notice this next sentence. He will love us if we fill our mind with his life-giving wisdom. And then it cites John 4.14. Well, let's take a look at John 4.14 here in the New World Translation. Jesus speaking to the woman at the well here. He says, Whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty at all. But the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water bubbling up to impart everlasting life. So this is the text that they cite. But there's another text that comes to my mind when I read this. Look at the paragraph again. Look at what it says. He will love us if we fill our mind with his life-giving wisdom. Is that statement even biblical? Take a look at 1 John 4.19, and I'm looking at this from the New World Translation. It says, we love because he first loved us. Now the King James Bible says, we love him because he first loved us. But either way, look at it, we love because he first loved us. Do you see anything? I'm going to leave that up so you can examine it for a second. This long verse of 1 John 4, 19, that's the whole verse. Does it say anything about if we fill our mind with his life-giving wisdom? He loves us only if we do that? No, that's not what it says. But the Watchtower says this, he will love us if we fill our mind with his life-giving wisdom. That's from the Watchtower. Notice Romans 5, 8. But God recommends his own love to us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I highlight that word recommends for a reason. I'm going to show you what the New King James says. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You notice it doesn't say there, look at it, it doesn't say he loved us because we filled our mind with his life-giving wisdom. No, it says he demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The problem with this scripture in Romans is if you're a Jehovah's Witness and if you look at it from the watchtower point of view, this doesn't apply to you. 
This doesn't apply to the rank and file witness. This applies to the anointed ones, those that they call the anointed ones. So see, once again, you're robbed of something that Christ has done for you, something that God has done for you in demonstrating his love and having Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. Yet this article is trying to say, if you do these things, then God will love you. This is very, very bothersome to me. You know what the problem is? The life-giving wisdom is what the organization is telling you. It's not what God gives you. It's not the gift that God gives you in Christ Jesus. What they're saying is that the wisdom comes from the organization. And you will see that as we cover a couple of more paragraphs in this Watchtower article. One more verse I want to share with you is John 3.16. Does it say, he will love us if we fill our mind with his life-giving wisdom? No, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Of course, the New World Translation has to say, whoever exercises faith in him. And how do you exercise faith, according to the organization? By being at congregation meetings and by following the whims of the governing body. That's really how they consider it. They don't say it that way, but that's really what they mean. Let's move on to paragraph 5. When we fear Jehovah, we are careful not to excuse bad behavior. Leo, who lives in Congo, learned that lesson. Four years after his baptism, he got involved with bad association. He thought that as long as he personally did not engage in bad practices, he was not sinning against Jehovah. Soon, though, his bad associates led him to abuse alcohol and commit immorality. He then began to reflect on what his Christian parents had taught him and on the happiness that he had lost. So I want to reflect on this part and on the happiness that he had lost. What was the happiness that he lost? Well, obviously, from reading the paragraph, he lost his standing in the congregation and therefore none of his brothers and sisters or his family would associate with him. So he lost that happiness of having those friends. Notice the next part of the paragraph. It says, the result, he came to his senses. So because he was being shunned and he wanted that association back, he came to his senses. And how did he get back? to a good standing with God. It wasn't through a relationship with Jesus Christ. It wasn't from the way, the truth, and the life, who is Jesus. No, take a look at what the paragraph says. The result, he came to his senses. With help from the elders, he returned to Jehovah. So with help from the elders, it wasn't the help that Jesus gave him. It wasn't the help from reading and studying the Bible. It wasn't help from God's Spirit. Nothing like that. It was help from the elders. So see, the organization keeps you on the straight and narrow path. It's not by God's Spirit. It's not by the Spirit of His Son dwelling in your heart. Oh, that's right, because as a rank and file witness, you cannot have the Spirit of Christ Jesus dwelling in your heart because you are not one of the ones that they call the anointed. Only they have the indwelling Christ living in them according to their false doctrine. You see, friends, it's frustrating. It's frustrating when you read the Bible and you think things apply to you and they don't. And then when you read a paragraph like this and you see that this brother, he wanted his association back. Now, he may have wanted, he may have felt like that's the way he had a relationship with God because that's the way the organization makes you feel. But there's nothing in the scriptures that say that. In fact, look at that account that we opened with about the woman at the well. Take a look at that account and read it carefully. And it says, the time will come when neither here nor there will you worship, neither here nor in Jerusalem. You see, the worship comes from you through Christ to God. And sure, we should not forsake the gathering of ourselves, as some have the custom, I think the New World Translation says, and we should be gathering together. But it doesn't mean at the Kingdom Hall. It doesn't say at the Kingdom Hall. It means with those of like faith other Christians, people who will lift you up. So when I look at this paragraph, when it says, with help from the elders, he returned to Jehovah. Do you think the elders really helped him? I'm just asking. There are some that I'm sure do. I know there are some who do. But really, what did the elders do? Did they sit down and study with him while he was disfellowshipped? Did they visit with him and sit down? Or did they, did they take him out and say, you know, Let's, let's sit down and, and discuss some things. Let me see, what can I do to help you? Is there anything that we can do as a body of elders to help you progress? What do you think? Do you think that really happened? Maybe it did. 
I can't say for sure. But from the experience that I have had being around the organization almost all of my life as a kid and then even as a big part of my adult life, when I look at that, I see that this is not normally what's done. Most of the time, all the elders do is they meet with you again and they say, no, we think you need more time or yeah, we feel like you're ready. That's, that's pretty much the end of it. And they might say, we're here to help you, but then they limit that time or association that they have with you. And the elders are the very ones that should be there and should be the shepherds and should be shepherding the flock of God. But let's go back to this article. If you look at paragraphs 17 and 18, it starts off talking about using the imagery of two figurative women. And then it calls one a stupid woman and the other one the true wisdom. Now, the organization chooses this word stupid woman, and I really think they kind of do that as a derogatory term. The King James uses the word foolish woman. Foolish just sounds better, and it's actually more along the lines of what the Hebrew language uses there in that particular verse. But when we look at this, who is the foolish woman or the stupid woman, and who is the woman of wisdom? Well, the woman of wisdom is the organization instead of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus in 1 Corinthians 1.18 is called the wisdom of God. And we see in Proverbs 8 that Jesus is wisdom personified. But the organization wants you to look to them for the wisdom and nowhere else, not to God's word. So the stupid woman is anything but the organization. And the woman of wisdom is the organization itself instead of Christ Jesus. So once again, in a subtle way, if you read this Watchtower article, you will see they're replacing Jesus with themselves. And they do this in subtle ways, and they do it in brazen ways as well. I just thought I'd use that word since it was there in the article. Friends, there are many things I could point out in this article, but unfortunately my time constraints don't allow me to dig as deep as I have in the past. I, like I said in the past, I'm gonna to try to continue to do these videos and continue to go through these things. And I just hope that you will keep studying. Remember that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And I thank you for praying for me. I thank you for praying for my friend who is in the hospital, the elderly lady that, that we take care of. And friends, I will keep praying for you that Jehovah will continue to bless you until we meet again.